So the challenge for RBI is to manage inflation even as growth is uh, in a slump. Yes. If you lifted the yes. lockdown at the point of time, people will always say, why didn't you lift it earlier? Yes. Some people will say, why didn't you stay a little longer? And the government, you must understand, is also operating in a very uncertain environment. A lot of known unknowns. So I think they've done uh, what is possibly the best. As much as this is a test for the inflation targeting framework, there are in fact more stringent tests. And I believe that the time has not come for direct monetization by the RBI. All of us, all the governors, spoke in favor of some privatization of public sector banks. If the government has to let public sector banks operate as private sector banks, why be in banks at all? Just move out of that. Dr. Uh, for giving time for the viewers and listeners at India Podcast today. We are really privileged to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, since the COVID pandemic has hit past uh, six months back and much before that, a lot was happening in the Indian economy. A lot of buzz was happening. And I know from your point of view, you might be having so many thoughts on how things are going. According to you, uh, you have held so many dignified positions in the past uh, in different portfolios and uh, most important being uh, as a former RBI governor, just during the uh, time we had seen a major crisis hitting the globe. What are the immediate challenges you think RBI is facing currently, even though it's trying its best to cope with the situation that we are all in? together? Yeah. I, I think, th let me talk about two challenges that the RBI is confronting in the present situation. The first challenge is an appropriate response to rising inflation in the context of the growth slump. And the second is an appropriate response to surge of capital inflows uh, given the inflation targeting framework. So let me elaborate on the first one, on an appropriate response to rising inflation. Okay, uh, the uh, RBI is under an inflation targeting framework uh, and is committed to keep inflation plus or minus, plus or minus 2% of 4% central level. Around the world, COVID-19 has produced two opposing forces on inflation. There is demand destruction, which has been disinflationary, and there are supply constraints, which are inflationary. So in much of the world, especially in the rich world, the demand destruction has overpowered supply constraints with the result that is net disinflationary. India has been contrarian in the sense that uh, supply constraints on account of the lockdown have overpowered demand destruction, we have inflation. Uh, we saw that most prominently in the October review, when inflation was above the tolerance level but there was uh, the growth concerns, so RBI uh, stood back on the rate action. The market took that in its stride. But the challenge for RBI is going to be to manage inflation within the inflation targeting framework, while at the same time keeping track of recovery. On the second one, uh, should I talk about that as well? Second challenge for uh, both the capital inflows. Okay, uh, the second thing is, you know, RBI is today confronting the classic case of impossible treatment. Uh, allowing capital flows to come in, restraining rupee appreciation, as well as ensuring, uh, keeping a check on inflation. So, so far RBI has managed that very well uh, by absorbing much of the BOP surplus. But the ability of RBI to do that, uh, you know, for much longer is limited because that will uh, throwing liquidity into the system, which is inflationary. So we will have to carefully manage this impossible trinity, keep the capital account open, 
even as uh, they have to keep a check on inflation. Do you think that government also, or or to say, uh, there a lot of uh, impact is coming because the delay because of the delayed decision in opening of the lockdown or getting back <clears throat> to the economic activity. Does that have any impact in the current scenario? That the unlocking took a little more time, or could have been different if we would have started unlocking the economy <laughs> once. Because there's a lot you of know, arguments around it. Yeah. There's no other answer that. Oh, you can yeah, yeah, most certainly, it's a very complex public policy issue. There's always uh, so many counterfactuals. Yes. If you lifted the lockdown at the point of time, people will always say, "Why didn't you lift it earlier?" Yes. Some people will say, "Why didn't you stay a little longer?" And in the real world situation, there are no counterfactuals. So you can always look back and say you should have done it. And much of the wisdom, or much of the criticism, comes with the benefit of hindsight. And the government, you must understand, is also operating in a very uncertain environment. A lot of known unknowns. So I think they've done uh, what is possibly the best under the. Depth of uncertainty and given the incomplete information. So there are also critics are saying that RBI's hand are tied in managing the fallout of the COVID crisis because of the inflating, inflating, inflation targeting. Uh, do you agree to that? And also, do we need to go into a very target expense method now further? Yeah, yeah. I've heard that view, which is that uh, the inflation targeting framework has tied RBI's hands in managing the crisis and. Um, uh, the, the contrary, contrary view, which is that if in fact there was no inflation targeting framework, RBI would have been more free to manage the crisis. There is some credence to that view, but I think we've got to take a more nuanced uh, view of this whole situation. The logic of inflation targeting anywhere in the world is to tie the hands of the central bank. In normal times, that results in optimal, uh, that gives optimal results because it gives stability and therefore encourages support growth. But you should not tie the central bank's hands so tightly that it cannot respond to an extraordinary situation. And what we're going through today is an extraordinary situation. And the October situation, uh, policy environment that I referred to a short while ago represents or illustrates that extraordinary situation. So are we have managed that quite well? by staying back on the rate action, uh, assuring that inflation will come below the tolerance level over the next few months and supporting growth. But let's say that infl inflation stays close to or above the tolerance band. Can RBI continue to stay back? RBI will have to act. If RBI did not act, inflation expectations will get entrenched and it'll become a generalized inflation. On the other hand, growth will get hurt. So it's a big dilemma for the RBI. But you know, you, have, you also have to understand that the, as much as this is a test for the inflation targeting framework, there are in fact more stringent tests. Uh, a lot of people ask, has inflation targeting worked in India? It's worked so far quite well uh, because the targeting, inflation targeting framework has not been fully tested. The test will come, for example, if the surge of capital inflows uh, and RBI will have to raise interest rate even if the inflation situation does not warrant that. Like what happened in 2013 during the taper tantrums when I was the governor, that will be a test for the inflation targeting framework. Test will also come if the government has a huge borrowing program, has a very high fiscal deficit, when there is private sector demand for credit. Today, the market is able to bear the government's borrowing because private demand for credit is low. But what if there's high private demand for credit? That will be another test for inflation targeting. So as much as I think inflation targeting framework has served us well so far, we also have to understand that it's not been fully tested. So then with your uh, answer only, I have another question. As we know that uh, in the view of government's huge borrowing, uh, there's this whole clamor for the direct monetization of the deficit, but your view has been against that. What What is your understanding into it and what do you stand for? Yeah, I wrote about that and I also spoke about that in some interviews before. Uh, the case for direct monetization of government's deficit by the RBI 
is made on the ground that the government has a huge borrowing program. If the government borrows that much from the market, there's just not enough savings in the economy to finance that sort of borrowing. Yields will spike. Financial stability will be threatened. Therefore, RBI must step in and directly finance the government's deficit. But there is no evidence to support such a scenario. The market feels quite comfortable about financing the government's debt. Yields are still quite soft. In part, in fact, in a large part, because of the extraordinary liquidity infusion done by the RBI. So, so far we're okay. But critics also say, or people who ask for direct monetization say, that the RBI is doing open market operations, which is in fact indirect monetization. So why this fig leaf? Why, don't, why, why doesn't the RBI just do direct monetization? I think calling it fig leaf is a misunderstanding of the difference between direct and indirect monetization. You know, when RBI does open market operations or what people call indirect monetization, that's also equally inflationary. But RBI is in the driving seat. Open market operations are a monetary policy tool. RBI decided the timing and quantum of open market operations depending on monetary policy requirements. Whereas direct monetization, uh, the liquidity management or liquidity infusion is governed by the government's borrowing requirements and the timing of that. So if the market feels or if people feel that the RPI is losing control over money supply, losing control over inflation, that can be very costly. So I think there is a very distinct difference between open market operations and direct monetization. And I believe that the time has not come for direct monetization by the RPI. Do you see that come by very soon? I mean, are you seeing the, <laughs> are you seeing the situation uh, roll to that uh... I am maybe. not seeing that. You know, I'm not, I don't follow. Because, because the demand, somewhere we see that the whole economy seems pretty log jammed somewhere. The demand is not picking up. The credit books of the banks are not uh, increasing. So there seems to be a place where it might all just collide into each other. So do, do you yeah, think? Yeah. Maybe? Yes, of course. You know, the, the answer to your question is in your question itself, right? So far, it's been okay. It's been a benign situation because there's no private demand for credit. And therefore, uh, there's been no requirement or there will be no need for uh, direct monetization of the deficit. But there might come a time in the future if private demand for credit picks up and if the government continues to borrow heavily, there might be a need for the RBI to intervene directly. But I don't see that come because if in fact private demand picks up, we would also see the government fiscal deficit going down and government borrowing requirement yes. going down. That's, that's pretty logical, sir. Uh, going further, sir, about the banking space, I think that's where you've spoken a lot. You've spoken about the importance and need of uh, the bad bank. Uh, it's being very important there. Uh, I have a question that we've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, mention of privatization of PSBs. And uh, with the launch of the book with uh, Mr. Tamal Bandapadhyay, who is also a veteran journalist, uh, a lot has been discussed or argued for some privatization of PSB. You at one end of the spectrum, uh, complete privatization. Do you still hold to that uh, ground and why so? How will that benefit? Because when yeah. we spoke to the PSBs, they really don't find a, a, a solution out there. Because right yeah. now in the scenario, we are all in both the banks are not doing great to say so. So how will privatization help? Yeah, the book that you referred to, Tamil Bandapadhyay's Pandemonium, has an entire chapter on uh, bank privatization, public sector bank privatization. And you also interviewed four past governors, including me and all of us. I have this in my read on what the other governors said. All the governors spoke in favor of some privatization of public sector banks although there was differences in terms of how much privatization management must be done and how it must be done. But all the governors were in favor of moving towards privatization. And as you said, I was at one end of the spectrum saying that there must be complete privatization and there must be a plan for that. Must be perhaps a 10-year plan 
for complete privatization starting from 12 public sector banks to date, it may be zero in 10 years' time. And my logic is as follows. You know, bank nationalization was done 50 years ago in a different era, in a different context. Uh, in the event, public sector banks did a commendable job. Bank nationalization delivered some very many positives, particularly in the spread of banking to the hinterland of the country, in deepening financial inclusion, in redressing rural poverty. You know, there are many, many causes for the reduction in poverty over the last several decades. An important reason for that certainly must be the credit flow from public sector banks to, uh, uh, to rural households and the farm sector particularly. So public sector banks have delivered, nationalization has delivered some very, very commendable big positive gains. But today times have changed. Circumstances have changed. The rationale for the continuance of public sector banks as FDFA. And I think the financial sector today is deep enough and mature enough to conduct financial intermediation without the government at the driving seat. Let me also say this, you know, uh, a lot of people say that no, let the government be in the banking space, but let the government be at arm's length, let there be a holding company structure, let them implement the NIAC committee recommendations, give complete autonomy to the management, let public sector banks run on private sector lines and compete with private banks. My question to that is, if the government has to let public sector banks operate as private sector banks. Why be in banks at all? Just move out of that and privatize the banks. And I believe the financial sector today is, or today or over the next 10 years, will be mature enough to meet the financial needs of the economy without the government at the driving seat. So with individual cases, again, I'm not being generic with your answer. Uh, don't you think there's a there's a kind of trust deficit that has come in the market with cases like ICICI or Yes Bank? They were private banks, and we saw a SBI take over SBI, uh, Yes Bank to help it come back on on their feet. So, do you think uh, that trust would be regained in private banks also? Although some of them or most of them are performing good, and as you said, public sector banks have a major contribution towards the agri schemes, the rural approach that they make. So do you really think that private banks will be ju doing justice and the trust can be brought back to the people and the customers? I think so. You know, you you raised a very, very important issue. Trust is at the heart of uh, banking. And every time there is a financial crisis, every time there's a bank failure, the issue of trust comes up. It's not unique to our country. We saw, we saw that during the global financial crisis. Uh, in, the, in the rich countries. We saw that during the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis. We saw that during the Asian crisis in, in East Asia. And we're seeing that every time a private bank uh, comes under pressure or is crumbling, we see the issue of trust coming up. So it's not unique to our country. It's not unique to private banks. And trust needs to be restored. But I don't believe that restoring trust uh, in banking means that the government remaining at the helm in public sector banks. Okay. Uh, you can have a banking sector without government involvement. Uh, of course, trust is important, but it is not necessary or indeed sufficient for the government to be in the banking sector for the banking sector to inspire the trust and confidence of people. Trust and confidence of people in the banking sector will be inspired by how bankers behave, how banks conduct their business, how regulators supervise and regulate the banking system. The two particular case should not be looked at as the way that private banks can go wrong. It should be individual cases I, that should be looked at. I, I should think so. I, I, yeah. You know, in a, such a large banking system, there will always be uh, some pressure. Some, some black some, sheep. <laughs> yes, some black sheep. And you cannot generalize on that basis. Beautifully said, sir. One question before I have to let you go is on the bad loans. You've spoken enough about it. Where do you think it originated? Everybody has their own theory. Frankly, there were some signals during my time in the RBI. But we did not believe that it will blow out to be such crisis proportions. I must honestly admit that. 
And you know, it, not so much in my defense, but just for explanation, I must say that the financial sector can bear pressure for much longer than people believe. So pressure builds up, you don't see it in real time, you see it with the benefit of hindsight. And of course, it's the responsibility of regulators like the RBI to see it ahead of individual institutions. That's, what, that's the comparative advantage of a regulator. So to some extent, I must say that uh, I have some responsibility for the origin of the battlefield problem, but I might also said that uh, there are some mitigating explanations for why we're not able to see it in real time. But I also want to say, you talked about the causes of the bad loan problem. The popular perception, the common perception is that the entire bad loan problem we see today is a consequence of poorly capitalism. Government pressuring public sector banks to lend to their favorite corporates in return for political or pecuniary uh, kickbacks. There certainly must have been some crony capitalism, but to believe that the entire bad loan problem is because of crony capitalism is misleading from a policy perspective. There were very many other causes. One, of course, is you know, the restructuring done in the months after the global financial crisis. We were encouraging banks to restructure loans, just as the RBI is doing today, to asking banks to restructure loans. And in the process, some insolvent loans also must have been restructured. It happened on my watch as the governor. And looking back, I believe there is some truth to that. There's some truth to that view. And there was irrational exuberance. Uh, throw your mind back to the years before the global financial crisis, years 2005, 2006, 2007, even 2008, uh, there was an extraordinary investment boom, fueled by an extraordinary credit boom. There were editors. Uh, as they say, bad loans are sold in good times. Uh, investors making demand projections as if the good times will go on forever. And now with the benefit of hindsight, we know that that was unrealistic. That was another important reason. And there was also this fact that much of that investment went into infrastructure. And infrastructure is an uncharted territory, both for corporates investing and for the banks lending to them. And there were lots of misjudgments made in the process of learning. And there were Supreme Court orders, right? Cancelling wireless spectrum allocation, coal block allocation, restraining mining exports. And there was policy paralysis in the government because of alleged corruption or uh, scandals. So it was, a cocktail, it was a cocktail of all these factors that produced the bad loan problem. And to attribute it to one single cause, I think, is misleading and short. Did side. RBI fail to raise the red flag on time? Because they blamed RBI also that it's your duty to, because you keep it on your check and radar. So how could you miss the presumptions or the projections in time? Yeah, I spoke to that earlier. Yes, it's the responsibility of the supervisor and regulator whenever a bad loan problem comes up and becomes a problem of this higher proportion on nearing a crisis having an impact on growth, questions will certainly be raised as Tamil Bandhapadhyay did indeed raise in his book about whether the RBI fell short in its uh, regulatory and supervisory oversight. And that's a question I'm sure RBI must have been prospected on, uh, you know, uh, in the months and the years after, after I left. I see that they've taken a lot of corrective action and it's a continuous process of learning on the I'm sure. And I know it's a knowledge institution. They learn from their shortcomings. Will Atma Nirbhar project help? That's the way the government is quite projecting. I mean, do you want to comment you know, on the <laughs> approach? The Atma Nirbhar package is such a white canvas that you can look upon it as a solution to every, every problem we have. But frankly, uh, the Atmanirbhar package is one with the penchant for the Modi government to give out the slogan or give out an idea or give out a program without fleshing it in and let it be fleshed in, uh, as, in the course of public debate and uh, discussion on the issue. So when you, when you ask me, is Atmanirbhar package a solution to the that GDP problem? 
you can say yes and be right, you can say no and be right, but I think we need a more specific uh, response to the debt GDP problem. That debt problem does go to loom very large in the short to medium term. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Subarao. But before you go, we have a small uh, one minute thing to always uh, ask our guest, and that is uh, your favorites that you learned in the pandemic. What are the two new habits that Dr. Subarao has adopted during the last six months in your life? It's going to stay with you. It's, it's going to be disappointing for you to say, but I, you know, I'm one of the minority in the world whose lifestyle has not changed very much because of the okay. pandemic. Uh, because I've always been a self-contained person, I've missed a little bit of traveling, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I, what's, what's changed in my, I, I live to a routine usually, but it's become even more routine now. I brush my teeth at the same time, have my lunch at the same time, have my tea at the same time, and I'd like some variation in that. So more of movie binging or Netflix binging has happened during the quarantine. Are you the person who likes watching a lot of new series and Netflix stuff and, you know, or old movies? What, are your, what, is, what is your choice? Well, given a chance, I like to see old movies. I don't very much watch Netflix. You know, you need, you need to invest. Uh, in, I don't mean invest in terms of money, but invest in terms yes, of your time, time uh, to do that. But I've not done that so far. When I chance upon a movie on a flight or something, I see that. So which is your favorite movie, if we have to know, from the old timers? So we know your taste because you've been there uh, serving our country. Uh, I've seen Amir Khan movies. Uh, you know, I like them. I like Shah Rukh Khan movies as well. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I thought you would go back to Rajasthana days or something on, on the line of Devan and the no, no, no. classic. <laughs> well, if you want me to go back to old times, I like Gone with the Wind. It's a fantastic movie, I believe. Uh, yeah. I don't know it's if you've seen it, but it's a wonderful movie. Yeah. And so last question, are you into book reading? Are you someone who loves to spend time reading books? Or are you more of... Uh, yes. Uh, although I must say that uh, there are more, more books than I want to read than books that I have read. Yeah, I, I do read books, yes. Any uh, specific suggestion for our viewers that this is a good Well, book. not suggestion. People have their own choices and preferences and interests. But I'm reading Sapiens by Harari. I've read it before, but I'm reading, reading it once again because I'm fascinated by the white canvas, uh, the very many subjects, the struggles, ideas that it brings upon. Uh, you can always find fault. Uh, you can always... Uh, you know, join issues on many things he says, but it does give you something to agree with or disagree with. So I'm fascinated by that book. I also read, you know, it's not a very original thing to do in, in a time of crisis, but I've also read that Krugman's books on depression. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. That's interesting. And the last thing, Dr. Shubhara, if today uh, you were in the office, RBI office, in the situation where we are, it's called the biggest crisis again in the world. Uh, is there anything that you think you would have done or have not done? Is there any one thing? Politically correct, you can give us something on that front, but... I, I think I think RB and the Governor Das. <laughs> I think yeah. RB and the Governor Das has done an extraordinary job. And it's... Uh, no, I don't believe that there's anything I would have done differently, actually. Uh, they've done everything that's necessary, and that's politically correct answer. But I believe that's also intellectually correct. You know, RBI, as I told you earlier, is a knowledge institution, and the governor acts on the basis of uh, all the analysis that's given by the staff, all the advice that's given by the senior management. So I believe RBI has uh, uh, you know, measured up to the task of managing the pandemic crisis. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabura, again. And we hope someday we read some books written by you or something that you come out with and we get to see your perspective in a uh, in larger view and we can read through it. Are you working on something? Are you looking at writing a book soon? Well, I've been, I wrote my book on RBI experiences four years ago. Ever since then, I've been wanting to write a book, but that's been more of a, a wish than a reality. Let's okay. hope, as you say, let's hope it will come out sometime soon. Wow, we would be awaiting to see that and get a chance to talk to you on that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Thanks. It's our pleasure. Thank you.